Hey, hello, hello everyone. Welcome, Bichong and uh, Angel from Pinterest to join us to give the uh, amazing talk about the deep graph learning for search and the recommend recommender systems. So Bichong has been a key designer of recommendation algorithms used in LinkedIn and Yahoo, which powered the LinkedIn new news feed, job recommendation, article recommendation, and uh, key Yahoo site, including Yahoo homepage, Yahoo News, and others. His research in this field resulted in more than 20 academic papers <laughs> published, in the, published in the CAACM, KDD, World Wide Web, WSDM, ICDM, EMNLP, etc. In addition to recommend, uh, recommender systems, his experience also include uh, utilizing machine learning and uh, statistical modeling to improve data analysis capabilities of data warehouse houses and the privacy analysis in data publication, which also resulted in more than 10 papers published, published in conference like the VLDB Sigmod and journals like the TKDD VLDB. So Bi Chong is a senior machine learning architect at Pinterest today. Today, he's going to present uh, this with his colleagues, Angel Zai, who was also a tech lead uh, at Pinterest. Now, let's welcome Bichong and Angel to present. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bichong Chen, and uh, today, Angel and I are going to show you uh, how to use deep graph learning to power search and the recommender systems. Um, Am I sharing the slide? Probably not yet. So let me do it again. Hmm, okay, it works. Um, so every good uh, online media company starts with a meaningful vision. Uh, for example, at Pinterest, our mission is to bring everyone the inspiration to create a life they love. All the machine learning and knowledge graph efforts are made to help us to achieve this mission. So in order to achieve this mission, um, we first need to bring users on site through notification, emails, uh, and also search engine uh, optimization, uh, in which um, search and recommender systems are heavily used. Once the user is on site, um, we need to onboard the user in order to know more about what the user is interested in and also continuously educate uh, users um, so that they know what the site can provide them. Again, search and recommended systems are also heavily used here. Then we delight and satisfy users through personalized recommendation, related content recommendation, and also different kinds of search capabilities. Uh, for example, once you open uh, the Pinterest app, you see a feed of recommended um, images and the videos. Um, you can also search for ideas like uh, living room designs. Right? So you see um, many images related to living room design. Uh, after you click one, uh, you see the details of that uh, image or video and also uh, a feed of uh, related uh, images and the videos recommended to you. On Pinterest, people spend a lot of time exploring uh, ideas through this related content recommendation. So how to uh, effectively build such um, search and recommended systems? In our experience, the key is the ability to extract um, knowledge from different kinds of graphs. So what are those different kinds of graphs? Um, at Pinterest, uh, we have a corpus of uh, tens of billions of uh, uh, these content items. Each content item is more like an image or a video with uh, some description. Uh, one of the most important graphs um, is the so-called pinboard graph, in which uh, people save uh, images or videos right, into boards, and also they give each board a name. Okay, and uh, uh, this graph um, encode uh, knowledge about what kind of content item inspire a user for what kind of idea. 
right? So you can think of this as a massive um, human labeling effort right, that result in a kind of like a knowledge graph, right, but different from the traditional knowledge graph. And we also have traditional knowledge graph based on taxonomies and also uh, classifiers that classify this content into different nodes in the taxonomy. Um, users interact with uh, content items through click, like, save, and the share. Right? These user activities form the user content interaction graph. Users and the users, they also interact with one another through follow, message, and other activities. Right? These activities form the user-user interaction graph. Such queries are also connected to uh, images and the videos or the content items uh, through relevance labels and also click, save, and different kind of user activities. Uh, each of and each of these age edges uh, is also associated with a context. For example, uh, when the edge was formed, um, where on the site, who were involved, and also what this age is about. Okay. Now we have all these different kind of graphs. Uh, how do we build a effective recommender system and a search system right, based on this? Um, the deep learning approach is actually quite conceptually simple. We first learn an embedding vector for each content item. And so for example, here, F uh, is a neural network that take a content item, let's say item I, and also the neighbors of item I in the graph as the input and the output, a uh, embedding vector right, that basically capture everything about this item. Here, this theta one uh, represent uh, all the weights or parameters uh, of the uh, neural network. And these neighbors include, for example, first hop neighbors, second hop neighbors, and also potentially through a random walk. So we do the same for um, users and also queries. But after we have these embedding vectors, um, second, we use uh, these embedding vectors to predict uh, user satisfaction. Uh, for recommender systems, right, we use uh, item embeddings, uh, user embedding, and also the context as the input in order to predict the probability that uh, uh, this content item satisfies uh, the user. Okay. Uh, and this label right, is actually also come from uh, the, the graph that uh, we just talked about. Right? So this usually come from the uh, user atom interaction graph. Uh, for a search uh, model, right, we take uh, item embedding, user embedding, query embedding, and also the context in order to predict um, whether the probability that uh, the item satisfy the query, right? So this label for, for, for the learning, uh, for the supervised learning also come from um, the graph. Uh, in particular, this will be uh, item query interaction graph. Uh, these embedding vectors are only uh, a part of the overall end-to-end search and the recommender systems. But here we just use a content recommender system as an example. Uh, in order uh, to serve these items and recommend provide good recommendation to users, we also need tools uh, to help creators to create and ingest content and help them to target the right audience. And we also need a different kind of models uh, to determine whether a piece of content is trustworthy, safe to show to a user, and uh, satisfy certain quality bar and something like that. Also for users, we, want to we also need the models to determine whether the user is trustworthy uh, or is an um, abusive spammer or uh, the intent and the interests of the users and the many others. For the new item, we also need to explore uh, the new content a little bit, uh, give them some small amount of traffic in order to reduce our uncertainty about our understanding of these new items. Then we also need a corresponding system like uh, uh, index 
to be able to help us to effectively, efficiently retrieve uh, these candidate items and a multi-objective framework um, in order to satisfy different parties um, in the ecosystem. For example, uh, creators, uh, content consumers, and uh, uh, merchants, right? They also provide uh, some shopping content. Um, all of them are in the ecosystem and uh, they have different objectives and our recommended system need to be able to satisfy all of their objectives. Um, next, uh, Andrew is going to show you that uh, how we are uh, building search and remarkable systems uh, based on deep graph learning and also our lessons learned uh, in this journey. All right, thanks, Bichong. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. I think so. Sweet. Um, cool. So now let's go into some details of different methods uh, for representation learning on this Pinterest graph. Uh, let's re remind ourselves of the goal. Given this heterogeneous graph of entities, including content, search queries, users, and more, uh, we aim to learn these embedding representations uh, of these entities to power our recommendation systems. So we want to go from uh, this graph into uh, embeddings of users, uh, content, search queries, and more. The overall strategy is this. Starting with the formulation that Bichon described, uh, we want to learn a function that produces an embedding that takes uh, content features or entity features, as well as uh, potentially neighbors. This is a flow diagram of that same, what I just described, where we have a feature store including the features of the entities. For example, the visual and text embeddings of the content, um, and maybe just the raw text for the search query. Uh, we have optionally the Pinterest graph. We can use it in our model. We can uh, choose not to use it. It depends on performance at the end of the day. And they're all fed into this function f, uh, an embedding model that's parameterized uh, by this to produce an embedding. Uh, the other question then is, where are we optimizing here? What is the embedding? Uh, where are we learning? So here, what's interesting is that uh, we use the graph on both sides, right? We use the graph as an input, but we also use this heterogeneous graph to produce uh, edges that we predict, right? We want to learn embeddings such that positive relationships, positive edges in this graph uh, can be predicted above uh, any uh, randomly generated fake edges that we may try to uh, distract the model with. And that's like the overall strategy. We want to mine edges from the Pinterest graph to learn these relationships uh, so that we can identify true edges uh, out of these noisy uh, fake edges. And importantly here, uh, we the Pinterest graph is leveraged both as an input uh, as well as an output. Let's go in a bit more detail. Let's talk about how we approach this overall strategy with content embeddings. Uh, a pin is a content on Pinterest. And you can see that a pin predominantly consists of many components. Uh, the one that's most important is the image or video, but we also have text such as title and description. We have the user that created the content, and we have this uh, notion of a pinboard graph. It really is something special uh, to Pinterest where the overall idea in a bit more detail is that users can save content into different collections, right? For this kitchen pin, this uh, one user may be focusing on these blue accents uh, that you see in, in, in the kitchen pin. So you see that this user has a blue accents board that has a lot of different furniture uh, really focusing on the color. Another user saves the exact same content uh, into a board for uh, vintage kitchens, right? This user cares more about the aesthetic style of this image. They, they care about this other dimension of the content uh, and organizes their board uh, to reflect that. And lastly, this might be hard to see, but there is a little fireplace at the very end, and some people uh, do save uh, that into a fireplace board. So users care about different aspects of the content. What's really special about Pinterest is that we have this data, again, at incredibly large scale. 330 billion pins, 7 billion boards, organized by over 400 million uh, monthly active users. Um, Pinterest essentially is this rich curated graph of how people organize and describe things. And uh, the question then becomes like, if this graph describes all the nuances of content, how can we harness it to learn better content embeddings? 
PinSage is our solution to this. It's a graph neural network for pins. The overall idea uh, is that we want to, given this graph of th uh, 3 billion nodes, 18 billion edges, so we pruned the 330 billion pins into the most informative uh, 3 billion nodes uh, just for uh, this work. How can we take that pin board graph along with node features and curate the best content embedding that we can, we can find? The optimization objective for PinSage is uh, mining from the Pinterest graph, where we're able to mine uh, engagement or, or responses, feedback from the related content recommendations that uh, Bichan described earlier, where contextual to this given query, there's a feed of results and users can save, can click, uh, can interact with the content to, to curate this uh, Pinterest graph. Uh, so we mine true edges as well as mining uh, fake edges out to help the, to give the algorithm training data to, to learn. Um, with this type of data, you can then uh, choose any retrieval loss flavor of your choice. The one I described here is a triplet loss where, uh, well, a version of the triplet loss where we want to make it so that embeddings there, uh, of true positive edges are close together, uh, as similar as possible, uh, compared, uh, whereas negative examples, these fake edges, we want to push them far away in the embedding space as much as we can. So we want the embeddings to learn that these true edges should be close together in the embedding space compared to uh, these negatives. The PinSage algorithm has evolved over time. We started this work in 2018, and now it's 2022. So many years of iterations. Let's start with V1. V1 was quite um, not simple, but a more understood algorithm where we used uh, the vanilla GraphSage encoder, where GraphSage is uh, very well-cited work uh, that we leveraged for this uh, initial version. The overall idea is inductive learning, learning from features instead of nodes, so that we can generalize this model to new content uh, on the fly without needing to retrain uh, the model. The other uh, noteworthy part of uh, the encoder is using multi-hop uh, aggregation, where you can, for two-hop neighborhood aggregation, for example, here, you uh, sample your neighbors, and then you sample the neighbors and neighbors, and you aggregate all these results to create the final embedding. So you can see this multi-layer structure here. For this work, we decided to do graph sampling during training on the fly. Uh, and this is actually was quite expensive. We needed a 1.5 terabyte uh, RAM machine to do this because, for example, storing the feature store of 3 billion nodes in memory is actually quite expensive. And, uh, this was quite inconvenient due to this special uh, hardware requirement. 1.5 terabyte, uh, 1.5 terabyte of RAM uh, on a machine that has GPU serving uh, or GPUs is quite a rare combination even today in the cloud. We then evolved to V2, where uh, two main changes occurred. Because of this uh, inconvenience, we actually uh, addressed. We tried to figure out how to move the graph sampling uh, offline. But before I can talk about this, uh, the, the first part there is that we actually changed the way that we sampled the graph uh, from multi-hop neighborhood sampling, moving it to uh, random walk uh, instead. The overall idea is that for a given node, for a given example, we take 10,000 steps to generate uh, the visit count frequency distribution across uh, many nodes and take the top 50 sorted by this visit frequency. We then use the visit frequency uh, in the weighted aggregation of neighbors. The amount of times we visited that, that node has uh, encodes this importance of the node, and we use that in the weighted aggregation. Uh, by doing so, we're able to uh, massively improve the offline performance of our models. In addition to moving the walk to random walks, uh, we also moved the graph sampling offline to data preparation, so not during on-the-fly training anymore. The idea here is that we don't need to store a feature store in memory anymore during training. We can push it offline into your uh, flavor of Hadoop, Spark, whatever uh, platform you want to use, um, because we can fully materialize the data, uh, the data set in data prep and leverage commodity GPUs uh, during training. We only need to stream the examples uh, with self-neighbor features fully materialized instead of needing to do feature lookups on the fly during training. 
this flexibility of using commodity hardware allowed us to really iterate a lot more on our algorithms. We changed a bunch, including the architecture, loss function, et cetera. But for, for, for now, I'll describe V3 as two main changes. One, um, content on Pinterest, there are many different dimensions to it beyond just what con constitutes the pin. Uh, we have uh, web pins, we have video pins, uh, we have shopping pins where the merchant wants to optimize for gross market value. We have advertisement where we want to optimize for CTR, right? So uh, there are even within the content graph, there's a heterogeneous graph within it where uh, uh, advertisement, uh, advertisers, merchants, creators, they care about different actions uh, on their content. Uh, hence, we introduce a multitask learning uh, objective where we have 16 different objectives uh, for this model to create one content embedding that can be optimized for all these different nuanced use cases. Um, we then also introduced a change to our model architecture. So with the introduction of random walks, we, we then saw like, hey, why not early fuse the neighbor and self features uh, directly into a transformer where here you see every uh, component Every neighbor is an input to the transformer encoder as well as the self. And this is able to summarize and produce a final embedding via self fusion. And when you combine these two together, you actually get quite astounding results where on the bottom left, we see that uh, for 20 or for 12 of the 16 applications, um, we're able to uh, see quite, uh, so 12 applications are shown here uh, and we're able to see quite massive improvements uh, where here we're plotting V3 over V2 uh, in terms of performance. And we see that uh, the performance increase uh, ranges from single digit percentages to up to 50% increases on some tasks. We see at Pinterest that graph neural networks produce the best content embedding. Uh, we have a plot here, uh, one of our monitoring systems where we plot the performance of these models over time. Uh, to give us a confidence that these models uh, sort of work well more uh, generally. And we see that when compared to baseline approaches that we also monitor and comparing to visual embeddings, comparing to text embeddings, compared to embeddings uh, that are generated from the random walk directly, uh, PinSage is continuously uh, the best representation that we can produce for content. And this is shown through over 70 plus launches of this technology across Pinterest. Uh, there's recommendation systems, but there's also uh, using PenSage to produce, uh, to sort of classify whether or not a piece of content is safe for trust and safety, uh, as well as using PenSage to produce uh, the nodes in a, in a knowledge graph. I went into a lot of details for PenSage. It's quite important in the foundation of representation learning. Let's talk about search queries as well. How do we embed a search query? It's a very similar idea where Given the Pinterest graph, we're able to sample uh, edges such as search query, pin, uh, save, or clicks, et cetera, interactions from uh, the search product that we have on Pinterest. We also have random edges that we uh, use as distractors for the model. We then have a very similar architecture set up to PinSage. If you remember, PinSage, the content embedding we produced, uh, has both sides of the tower uh, be pin stage. We're trying to learn pin to pin similarity. Here, we're trying to learn search query to pin similarity. And uh, we can represent the query using sort of any modern day text encoder. Uh, for this example, I'm showing BERT. When you learn this model using uh, essentially the same optimization objective as pin stage, you're able to get some pretty astounding results where now you have a search system where you can type in any query and get fairly reasonable results out of it. Where here I type in a uh, peer shaped engagement rings and you can see these are the actual uh, results when you do an approximate nearest neighbors from the text embedding learned uh, compared to PinSage. This also has 10 plus launches across Pinterest. This work is a bit newer than PinSage. So there's also that aspect of time. Uh, but in general, we see, for example, leveraging this technology for retrieval allows us to increase uh, our product uh, long clicks or product clicks on Pinterest for our uh, shopping product. Let's talk a bit about users and sort of uh, to spoil the surprise, it's actually quite similar as well. We're given the Pinterest graph, we're able to extract out this uh, one year user history. So here 
uh, the interactions are flattened but sorted by time, uh, where we know the entire user interactions uh, done for a given user for the entire year. And we also have random edges as distractors as well. You can see that this picture looks quite similar to search stage also uh, to pin stage, where the idea is that we represent a user by their interaction history, right? So we have a transformer that encodes uh, activities that a user has done in the past and used to predict the pin activities in the future, where pin activities are represented by pin stage or content embedding. And then we have a triplet loss here where we're trying to uh, learn a user embedding that can predict the future pin activities uh, better than these like random distractor edges. And this had a lot of impact as well. 10 plus launches with a lot of uh, site-wide Pinterest impact where we increased time spent on Pinterest by one to 2%. We increased engagement on Pinterest by three to 4% and increased revenue by around 2%. Let me quickly go through challenges and opportunities that we still see. Um, in general, you might have seen that uh, for, we mostly use the pinboard graph as the most important graph uh, for inputs to our models. And the question then is what happens when you go to heterogeneous uh, graphs? We see some early results uh, where using heterogeneous graphs can uh, further improve performance, but this is very challenging. One. Uh, going to a heterogeneous graph is a 10x increase in the, sort of the graph size, where you're going from O of 10 billion edges to uh, O of 100 billion edges, and the infrastructure has to evolve uh, simultaneously to solve this. The other problem with heterogeneous graphs that we see is uh, we have uh, so many types of nodes, so many types of edges. And what is a random walk on a heterogeneous graph? For example, do we go from user to board to content, that meta path? Or do we go from user to search query to content, that, that meta path? Uh, one uh, challenge that we have is uh, we have a combinatorial number of these possible meta paths to walk. How can we set up the infrastructure? How can we set up the algorithms to uh, be able to figure out automatically what is the best combination? Because we have seen the path that you take is quite important for performance. In general, models at Pinterest are very dynamic, where we see that for the same model train on different dates of data, uh, the model essentially decays over time. Or what I mean here is that given this blue dashed line, uh, the model is trained and then we deploy into production. And then we see over 180 days that the model performance over a recall metric degrades over time. But whenever we're able to Whenever we retrain that same model, only changing the data, we're able to instantly recover the performance. So you can see that constantly, uh, whenever we retrain our fresh data, we're able to recover this performance. Uh, model evaluations in industry need to be two-dimensional where we have this time component as well. Uh, but if that were the only problem, it's actually not too hard, right? We can just retrain the model, we'd be done with it. Uh, what's really hard in industry is that uh, we have these complex model dependencies, right? Pin stage is dependent upon by 101 plus use cases where Pinterformer uses Pin stage. We have other use cases like the trust and safety classifier that also uses Pin stage. Uh, Pinterformer is also leveraged by ten, uh, like tens of other downstream applications as well. Uh, and essentially in industry, there's no sense of like, what is the, uh, what happens when you retrain uh, Pin stage? It's so, so upstream in the model. There is no equivalent of this application binary interface that we have in software engineering, where we're able to compile shared libraries without needing to recompile all downstream applications. That type of concept doesn't exist. And this is one of the largest challenges to uh, the model velocity for ML. Two more slides. I know we're running out of time. There's a lot more going on at Pinterest. I wish I could have time to describe it. We have a lot of embedding more representations of videos, products, creators, notifications. They all have their interesting nuances and quirks uh, to how we approach the problem. Uh, we, I wish I could share the initial results that we have for heterogeneous graph learning. There's just not enough time to talk about it. Uh, and then we also have interesting work where we apply GNNs more upstream in our system to create content. We want to be able to automatically figure out how to mine the attributes of, say, a website, uh, say, the recipe of a food website to populate that, uh, that data into Pinterest uh, as automatically. 
This is my last slide. These are the takeaways. Embedding the Pinterest graph leads to a sounding performance. Graph neural networks is a very effective tool uh, to be able to combine the graph and content features to build the best performing model. Content embeddings are the foundation of representation learning, and we need to evolve our algorithms and infrastructure together to lead to the best performance. Uh, and lastly, the most important thing is that Pinterest has a lot of technical challenges that are unsolved, and uh, we're not even close to a solved problem. That's All it. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bichong and Angel, to give this amazing talk. And thank everyone for attending the uh, for attending this uh, talk. Yeah, I saw there's some questions not answered, but please feel free to contact uh, Bichong and Angel offline, and uh, we can talk offline. Okay. Thanks, everyone.